Hello, welcome to Cliff Chats. My name's Clifford Kaufman. I'm a percussionist educator and interviewer based in Nashville, Tennessee. And I uh, wanted to let you all know that um, this uh, the Cliff Chats are a weekly live interview most of the time. Um, next week we'll be um, with Denny Fongheiser, the band Heart. Uh, and that will not be live. But um, every Wednesday at 12.30 Central Time, and then also every Tuesday at uh, 12.30 Central Time, I'm sorry, 12.30 Eastern Time as well, um, is a show and tell and free drum lessons with me uh, at the Sound and Rhythm Drumming School page. Uh, I'm really excited to have Leo Sidron on today. Uh, I've followed Leo for many years, uh, first discovering him through his podcast the third story which is an incredible podcast if you haven't gotten a chance to check it out and um i learned more about him that that he also is a producer a musician and also that his dad is a prolific musician and producer and um interviewer and um anyway so he comes from a lineage of musicians interviewers podcasters well not podcast originally uh, when he was 15 years old, he um, Steve Miller, but the Steve Miller band recorded um, four of his songs. Uh, he has been nominated for Grammys. He won an Oscar for uh, a song uh, in the motorcycle diaries and um, just very interesting guy. And I'm really excited to learn more about him. So I'm going to bring Leo on. Welcome. Hey, Cliff. Hey, thanks for doing this. Wow. Thank you for inviting me. I feel sometimes I forget. I don't know if you've had this experience that when you put stuff out in the world that people actually receive it and then they follow you. And I'm really I'm amazed to hear that you have been following me and, and um, so flattered and, and honored to be here. Oh, well, I'm I'm flattered and honored that you agreed to do this. You know, my sometimes my my thoughts when I ask people are like, oh, they're not going to do it. They're not going to, you know, and maybe you found that to be a thought sometimes as well. Um, but I found most people are pretty open to to doing and wanting to share. Um, and so anyway, I, I really appreciate you, um, you being here. Um, and so just before we were talking really briefly and, and there's, you know, with this, with this technology, there's, there are so many pros and there's some cons as well, the technology when it doesn't work, what, what are, what are some of the pros and cons you've found to, to the way we've been operating and kind of changed um, over the last few years with COVID and all that? From the, well, actually from the point of view of production and also doing my podcast and doing interviews like you do, I think the answer is kind of the same for me. Um, access was really expanded for me during COVID when we went remote because I had been doing my podcast since 2014, always in person. I actually asked people to come to my house in Brooklyn. And so it was a, you know, when I think back on it, it was a really big ask to have started a podcast that nobody ever heard before and demand that they come to me. And people did it, even still they did it. Mm -hmm. Over time, then I developed my little mobile rig where I could go talk to people. But during the pod, during a COVID, I could talk to people all over the world. It, it expanded my access to people. And I think more people are inclined to say yes if they don't have to go anywhere and they can just stay home. So that, yeah. um, I also think, I believed from the point of view of conversation, maybe mistakenly, that you could only really truly engage with somebody if you sat in the room with them, that th this thing that we're doing here wasn't the same form of 
whatever, you know, and I do think that we have to work a little bit harder like you're doing right now to just really acknowledge that we're here. There is that little latency that interrupts the flow. But I also came to discover that people tend to be maybe even more open more quickly when they're talking to you in the comfort of their own space, you know, so rather than having to come into an unfamiliar room, an unfamiliar house, and meet somebody new for the first time and engage, you know, authentically, now we can just like talk, I'm sitting in my house, you're sitting in your space. And maybe it, it even happens more easily, like, you know, this way, to just kind of break down the barriers. And in terms of like, you know, the production aspect of it, uh, again, access to people I called a lot of people that I probably would not have been able to count on to mm -hmm. play on, you know, records that I'm working on. And and that was great. I think a lot of musicians who didn't have their home studios together and their, their um, you know, DAW thing worked out. People bought microphones and, and computers and learned how to do it if they didn't know how to do it already. So that was cool. But I do miss... I think it's not the same when it comes to recording as it is with interviewing. Interviewing, we can still talk to each other. Performance-wise, it's really nice to be in the studio with people and and respond collaboratively. And I think I've been using Audio Movers, which is a really cool tool that allows you to broadcast out of your out of Pro Tools or Logic, and people can hear uh, a good quality uh, stream of you know what's being recorded. But it that still to me isn't quite where I would like it to be in terms of working remotely. But I did work remotely, like so many of us did recording remotely with people all over the world. And, you know, the FaceTime camera on one side and the uh, Pro Tools session open on the other side. And it, and it worked. Nice. Yeah. And I and I, I also should mention that you have a recently recent new album, uh, The Art of Conversation, which I think is very appropriately named. Um, and I think you have six albums. Is that correct? I may, yeah, maybe I, that, that might be right. <laughs> uh, many albums. Yeah. Um, and so, so you grew up with, you grew up around this and, and my, my goal in general, when, when having these conversations is to try to kind of not just go into the past that you've talked about. And I, and I'm, I'm guessing that's something that you also, um, you know, when I, when I was, um, researching and, and reading, you know, I, I always love to just learn about people and people working in the arts. And, uh, so anyway, so I enjoyed, I noticed you had many, uh, written interviews, but I didn't see as many, um, videos of you. Um, yeah. so anyway, so I'm glad we could do this, but there was one thing I found that I, that I, it really resonated with me that I would like to talk about. Um, you had mentioned something your dad had said, um, which is feeling good is a radical act. Um, and I just, would you, would you just t um, talk a little bit about what that means to you and, and maybe, yeah, what that means to you? Well, I think over the last couple of years, that has been a question that is being revisited in my life over and over again. You know, mm -hmm. this is the kind of thing that he has said throughout my life, you know, it's okay to feel good. His whole kind of point of view on stage when he performs, he's a piano player and he's a singer. And I spent a lot of my life playing drums with him. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've spent just months of my life on stage listening to him sort of develop this philosophy, jazz philosophy. It's improvised. It's, um, he improvises with ideas and words on stage and we play. And I've heard him say hundreds of times versions of this thing that, you know, this is sometimes it's an, it's, it's an act of, it's a radical act just to get together and feel good, particularly when the world is adverse, you know, mm -hmm. in the face of all of this adversity, uh, it can feel like, if not political, at least an, a radical act to just allow yourself to feel good. Yeah. Uh, and this is kind of what I think informs his whole approach to performance. And it has ultimately informed mine as well. Don't take yourself too seriously. It's okay to feel good. It's important mm -hmm. to feel good. It's important to make other people feel good. That's part of our job. I think in the political uh, environment, 
of the last five or six years, that became harder and harder to achieve. And I, my dad and I had these questions. Is it still okay to feel good? Yes, it's a radical act in the face of this to mm -hmm. feel good. How about in the face of a pandemic? You know, I think if yeah. anything, that was the, the one that really slowed us down in terms of how do we feel good now? And is it, is it appropriate? I mean, I, I kept asking myself, like, while I was making my record, does anybody care about what I have to say right now in the face of all of this? You know, this is like so serious and heavy. And, and I'm going to come out here with my little ditties and, and like, and I discovered once again, that not only is it okay to feel good, but that people took it seriously. And, and that it, I think the strength of conviction that it takes to come out and do something positive in the face of all this adversity is rewarded, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think I interpreted it a little bit differently that just uh, maybe in, in day to day life, feeling that feeling good is, is a radical act that maybe you're saying the same thing, but that that you, there's so many factors where where you're not supposed to feel good. You're supposed to you're, you're supposed to you're supposed to get a day job that's hard work. You're not supposed to um, do something you love. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are many people who think that way. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Have you, have you questioned throughout your, you know, you grew up around your, your father who, who has been doing this his whole life. Did you ever question what you're doing? I'm going to answer this question, but hold on one second. Cause I'm, I lost you for a second and I, yeah. I hope I don't lose you. Hold on. Okay. Thank you for those who are tuned in. Are you back? I'm back. I'm here. You got me? Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to say that question again? Yeah, say it again. Okay. So I was just wondering if you've questioned, you know, I, I, I questioned this is one of the reasons why I asked this is, is, um, is doing what you love. Is that a luxury? Well, it is a luxury. I feel like in a lot of ways, do you, um, do you, do you ever question that? Because I interpreted the the feeling good as a radical act, something your dad had said, and you said it sounds like it's sort of an ethos that he's lived by, and maybe you have as well. Um, that uh, have you questioned working in what, yeah. you know doing what you love? As you set that question up, you said something along the way also that reminded me of of another sort of part of that ethos that my dad always used to say, which is in terms of playing music and listening to music and and interacting with with music in the in the space of performance if you're not having fun you're doing it wrong mm -hmm. you know he would always say like it should be fun you know and and i think as you framed the question you said we we have this pressure to like get a job and work really hard and that it should always feel like like work mm -hmm. and um if it doesn't feel like work then maybe you're not being serious you're not taking it seriously mm -hmm. so i definitely have thought a lot about that and struggled like over the years kind of struggled with that thinking that I'm supposed to be stressed out. And if I'm not stressed out, then somehow uh, I'm not a serious person. Or, you know, I, if I'm not um, racing and losing sleep and like feeling stressed all the time, then somehow I'm not working at my, my fullest potential. It's been a long time for me to understand that actually that's totally wrong. You know, I can't be at my fullest potential when I'm stressed out and overworked and not sleeping and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. In terms of this question of selfishness, yeah, that's a, so big, man. Like, I go back and forth about it so often, and I really thought about it when all gigs and opportunities came to a screeching halt two years ago, and I thought, well, what what is our job? I mean, you know, I always thought about my job as kind of technical or like, being accepted by my peers, a huge part of my motivation was just making work that I thought other, I hoped other people would like. I just wanted to be taken seriously by the other people in my world. Mm -hmm. I didn't even really think about the audience for a long time, honestly. I didn't think about, even when I started my podcast, I was much more focused on the connection, like the one that you and I are having right now, than I was on whether or not anybody would like it and what it would mean to them. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we also have a job that selfishness is also converted into a kind of a form of generosity, hopefully, if we're doing it right. And we do we do make stuff that we put out in the world and hopefully it reaches people and they have their own relationship with it. Like 
these conversations, this, like the kind I have, and I think the kinds that you like to have too, they operate on two levels, right? Like they operate on the level of our own personal, whatever benefit, enrichment, joy. And mm -hmm. then also if anybody else, if one person sees a conversation and benefits from it, then you've hopefully sort of counterbalanced that selfishness with some act of generosity or of contribution to the world. Mm -hmm. If that makes, I don't know if that makes any, if I'm. It, it does. What, what do you, what do you view as selfish about being an artist? Well, it's a lot about going inward and going into yourself. You have to spend, I think in order to do it, you have to, whether or not you're talking about an artist in the sense of like, this is what I devote my life to, or just dealing with your craft and the amount of work that it takes to maintain whatever it is you're doing, the practice, the, to me, it's always been extremely solitary. You mm -hmm. know, the way I have developed what I do is, is very self specific. And, um, I spent a lot of time with myself in order to do it. I have to spend a lot of time with myself and, and deal with myself a lot. And so I guess on that level, it's, it's sort of, it's a selfish thing to do. Uh, I can. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so I know you have, you have a, a daughter and you're married. How did, how did that change the way you see what you do? Well, even before I was married, my wife has an extremely strong work ethic and, mm -hmm. Um, she, I think was the first person who ever showed to show me that what I do is work mm -hmm. and gave me the sense that I wake up every day and I work the same as anybody else who has a day job, maybe even more because I'm never free from myself, you know, and my job yeah. is sort of to be myself in a lot of ways. So, um, so that changed things initially when I met her and I, and I started to think about being a musician, being an artist, whatever it is I do as, as my job. And I had never thought about it as my job before. Mm -hmm. I just sort of thought this is what I do. Um, and when I had my daughter, when my daughter was born, um, it completely upended things for me in a very positive way. And looking back on it, I don't think this has to happen as a result of being a parent. I Sometimes when I say this, I feel like I'm somehow saying that I had to become a father to feel this way. But this is what triggered for me was I really started to think about legacy or about what I was leaving behind, the work that I was making. Mm. And until then, I had gone through this period of just kind of wanting to, um, well, first of all, make some money. I, like when I moved to New York, I, I was trying to find a way to make a living. And, and then also... Um, to be successful in a, I don't know, in, in, in terms that didn't really think long-term in big picture and, and like, uh, am I respected in the industry of advertising where I had been doing a lot of work, that kind of thing. But when my daughter was born, I thought, well, what, what am I leaving behind? I mean, what, what is the work going to look like in the future? If, if she wants to look back and see what was I doing all those days. And mm -hmm. so that, that really changed the, the way I oriented myself. That's when I started the podcast. That's also when I started making records again. I hadn't made my own solo music for a handful of years before she was born. And I just thought a lot about what statement I wanted to make. Yeah. And so one thing I really like that I, I, I know you've done something, you've, you've included your daughter in, and that sounds like a legacy too, because it sounds like you were included by your father where you would go to the local radio station and be on the show um uh but how how would you approach including your daughter mm. uh, you know, i think it's different doing it we're pre-recorded than live where you can obviously edit out but I, i've heard some podcasts where where your daughter's in it with you yeah i mean i, I was going to tell you like you, you are much braver than i am because i don't go live i mm. i believe in editing and i i like i think everybody looks great when you give them a good hair, good pruning, you know, and yeah. that's, that's sort of, so she's certainly benefited from that as I have and all of my guests have. Um, I mean, I, I encourage her to be a part of everything that I do and she's very, um, she's, we're not, she's, we're not similar in that way. I wanted to be around all the time. I was always beg begging to be part of what was going on mm -hmm. with her. I kind of have to, I have to gently 
you know, uh, entice her into doing it. And then it seems always to be positive when it happens, but she's, you know, she's very strong. I, I admire her a lot. I've learned a lot about people, about myself uh, and about the way creativity works in different people just by, by watching her and, and being mm -hmm. with her. But yeah, it's, it was always really important to me that she feel that this is all available to her and belongs to her and that, um, and that creativity happens in different ways. You know, she, if she may not want to be part of this, she can do her own thing, but, um, I'm constantly pulling her in to sing on things and ask her, I mean, I'm, I'm actually working on another record right now. And today I'm writing, working on a song, recording a song that is inspired by her called what's trending. Cause she's always telling me now what's, what's uh -huh. trending on social media or on online. And so I wrote a song that's inspired by her. So she's a huge muse for me also, which I think she, she can see how things that happen in everyday life affect the work that we make, you know, how old is she? She's 10. She'll be 11 soon. Okay. So yeah. That's noticing what's trending. Yeah. Uh, so in what areas is she, is she creative or what is she drawn to? She's, she loves to sing and play piano. Mm. Um, and she is not interested in co doing it in a collaborative way with me. She likes to do it alone mm -hmm. in some ways. That's like how I felt. Also, I, when I was a kid, I would go off into a room and try to make music by myself, but I also had this, really formative experience with my dad where we would jam all the time where I would play yeah. drums and he played piano. And, and that's kind of how I learned how to feel the, the music, the way I feel it was through playing with him. But, and so he, was, he was around a lot or was he, was he, you know, cause I know sometimes when people have musician parents who are touring a lot and that sort of thing. It's such a, such a good question. He was totally not around <laughs> and yet, and yet he was very much around. Like uh, he, at the end of the eighties, he, like added up all of his calendars and announced that he had been gone for five of the 10 years, Like he was really gone a lot. Uh -huh. But he, he also was very present when he showed up and um, somehow managed to feel very present in my life, even though he was gone so much. Uh -huh. That's great. Well, I mean, I think about that. I'm a, I'm a f father of a almost five year old and I would rather have more quality time than more time. And so that's, that's what it sounds like to me from an outsider perspective. I have, I kind of have a different thing going here because my studio is in between my bedroom and her bedroom. I mean, it's like, we kind of all live in this music room mm. and I'm just, I'm really here a lot. I mean, certainly the last two years I was here a lot and mm. we were all kind of in the house a lot, but, um, I know the quality time thing is really, is really major. And I, I, you know, I confess, like, I, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily doing that. Like I I'm here, yeah. just I'm really here. I'm just yeah. physically here all the time, but mentally sometimes I'm not here. I'm thinking about other things. Yeah. I uh, know. I mean, I think it's a challenge for everyone to be present for yeah. sure. Um, I, something I deal with all the time. Um, so, so you, you started as a, as a drummer, and, and I know you, you grew up in Wisconsin, I think in, is it Madison? Um, yeah. And Clyde Stubblefield lived there. And so he was a friend of your dad's and, and had a major influence on you. And you ended up playing gigs with him and trading off with him and sometimes playing double drums. Um, but, but I was curious, did, so did you, did you take formal drum lessons and then how did that evolve to, to writing songs, playing other instruments? I, you know, I, I want to commend you as a drummer for making it 25 minutes into this interview without <laughs> bringing up Clyde Stubblefield because I, I was sure this is what we were, we were going to get into this. Um, well, I, 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 as a drummer, I, I mean, this this is not just about drums for yeah. me. It's yeah. it's more about people living true themselves in, in, in the arts. Yeah, I, mean, I, I relate so much. Um, well, so... So Clyde was a friend of my dad's and did come over when I first got my drum set. And let me just interject really quickly. If, if anyone's listening who doesn't know who Clyde Stubblefield is, he was James Brown's drummer, a very, very well known in the drummer world for being James Brown's drummer. Sorry, go ahead. Indeed. No, the, important to, to say. So he and he incredibly landed in Madison, Wisconsin, which was not a likely 
stop for him, but he he had been on the road with James Brown and got off the road in the early 70s and, and made his home there until he passed away. Mm. So he was there and had been working with my dad all through the 70s. And I was born in the mid 70s. So when I started playing drums in the early 80s, he was around and he came over to the house and showed me something. And, um, you know, I, so much of it has been repeated to me over my life that I don't even know what my memories are and what mm. are the stories. But certainly my in my whole childhood, he was around and I did not study formally with Clyde. There was no way to study formally with Clyde that I that I'm aware of. I mean, Clyde mm. didn't really know how to talk about what he did. He knew how to show you what he did and he knew how to talk about his experience. But mm. he didn't he didn't have a like any kind of formalized technical approach that he that he could teach. But we got to watch him. I mean, not just me, everybody in Madison got to, we had all this access to him. So mm -hmm. he was, I guess, an early, you know, influence. On, and of course, when you're get, getting it from one of the greats, you don't often know it. You just kind of feel it. Mm -hmm. um, but I did study, take drum lessons with a couple of great teachers in Madison when I was growing up. One of them has become a, um, a pretty well-known drum educator in Minneapolis named Dave Stanek was one of my oh, first yeah. drum teachers. I have a um, friend who, who works with him a lot. Yeah. He's a great, he's become, I mean, he was a great teacher to me, but he's really flourished in the years since then and become, mm -hmm. you know, a wonderful educator. And, and, um, and he was at the university of Wisconsin um, at the time. So he was one of my teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I was probably, you know, entering high school, I wasn't really studying drums formally anymore. Uh, I, picked up lessons here and there from people. Once I started getting interested in really playing straight ahead drums, I remember I, I approached a handful of people in Madison and took a lesson or a couple of lessons. But at that point I was pretty, I think self, self taught. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also writing songs, messing around at the piano. I mean, I have to remind myself when I tell you that my daughter doesn't want to learn anything from me that I, refused to learn any piano from my dad. You know, he's a uh -huh. great piano player and I didn't want him to show me anything on piano. I'd let his friends show me and anybody else, but I wouldn't hear anything from him. But I did spend a lot of time at the piano. And, uh -huh. um, Start starting it, sorry, what age was that? I don't know, I have a mem memory of being about 11 and hanging out at the piano. I wrote songs before that we had a, key, a synthesizer in the house at some point that I would, I love technology. I mean, I was actually, my love of music and, and writing music and playing music was always kind of went hand in hand with my love of technology. And, mm -hmm. um, by the time I was 12 or 13, after my bar mitzvah, I took all the money I made in my bar mitzvah, I bought a bunch of gear with it. And so 13 and 14, those crucial years, I was like all in on, learning drum programming and sequencing and had a synthesizer and then a four track and then an eight track and then a dats and then computer. I mean, I was like following the steps at every turn to learn how to make music with computers and songwriting. I don't even know if I thought about songwriting. I thought about making stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and it kind of became songs. You know, I, I wasn't really writing songs that I could play alone on the guitar or the piano for a long time. I was mm -hmm. always recording things, figuring out how to record them and kind of shape songs out of that. Yeah, uh, it, it's well, one thing that I uh, I admire about the way that you grew up is just there's an or it sounds like there's an organic nature to it. Um, whereas for myself, I felt like a latecomer in a lot of ways to music. I was a, more into art at a younger age. And so I felt like I had to just focus on that. And it wasn't until I started to kind of stop focusing on and kind of have blinders on where things kind of opened up more. Um, so, so it sounds like you were kind of, you maybe didn't realize that, but you were learning production early on and that shaped your songwriting. And, and so that evolved. Yeah. I mean, as we talk about this in the context, again, of raising a family, being a parent, whatever, you know, I credit my parents enormously with recognizing what I was into and like, and letting me develop in that way rather than, focusing on the stuff I wasn't doing, like practicing drums or even studying any instrument in earnest. I was just mm -hmm. teaching myself how to produce. And uh -huh. um, I would listen to music and respond to it emotionally and technically at the same time. So if I, you know, was listening to, you know, Prince or James Taylor, 
you know, kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Either way, I would try to figure out what is making this make me feel this way. What is working here that and and then I would kind of do my version of it and and try to unlock whatever was happening, um, which is, I think, why eventually without realizing it, I sort of started doing what I do, which is essentially a, a combination of writing songs and producing them kind of all at the same time. Like that, that's kind of where I naturally sit. It's what I started doing when I was, you know, 13. Uh -huh. Do you feel like your worlds have kind of come together? You have some, some different interests or you might feel like, you know, this is over here and this is over there. Um, and, and, and if so, how, how has that happened? It took so long and there were so, there was so, such a long period of my creative life where I felt um, disjointed and I, I, I thought it didn't make sense. You know, I go out and play jazz gigs three nights a week in Madison and or play with my dad. And then I'd come home and the songs I wrote didn't seem to connect at all to that music. And and the stuff that I loved seemed so diverse. I loved Ani DeFranco. And then I also loved Michael Jackson. I couldn't figure out how to make all that stuff work. You know, I, I just didn't know how it was ever going to be coherent. And I thought I'm going to have to choose, you know, and I didn't want to choose. And then I don't know, just over time, it all started to feel like part of the same thing. M maybe it's a result of learning what doesn't fit and getting rid of that or mm -hmm. Um, subtraction instead of addition, maybe. Yeah. Subtraction instead of addition and also intention, you know, like, uh, I mean, I still go through it with my podcast sometimes where I, I think a, a lot of my listeners to my podcast are very jazz oriented because I talk to a lot of jazz musicians. And then sometimes I bring somebody in who's like totally unrelated. I interviewed Butch Vig, or I talk to people that don't have a jazz background at all. And I worry, is this going to make sense to them? Are they are they, are they going to abandon me now because I'm bringing all this other stuff in? But even with the podcast, what I've seen is the intention is so when the intention is so strong that it, it somehow manages to feel coherent, even when it might not look coherent on the page. So at this point, do you feel like the podcast is a part of the whole of everything? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Me. Um. Yeah. So for, for anyone who's just tuning in, the third story is, is Leo's podcast that we're talking about. And I, I, I just started revisiting, revisiting it um, recently because we were going to talk. And um, I just, I, I think the way you introduce it and, and just your, the, the way you, you um, the format that you've set up, it works really well. And, and I hope that it continues to grow. Um, so when I was doing research, I also found, um, I didn't realize that your, your dad had done interviews and I came across the, his interview with Miles Davis, which I think is probably his most well-known interview. And I saw some similarities in the way that you do it to, to how he was doing it. And he, he seemed so natural and, um, and real and and I really I also listened to an interview where you're you're actually with him on stage where he's talking about that interview and I thought it was really interesting you know just about everyone knows who Miles Davis is um, and there are a lot of legends and probably some myths about him but but he was saying when he asked to do it yeah you know it's like you'll do fine his friend said you'll do fine because you're as long as you're not BSing um, and so anyway so I found it really interesting after watching that interview to. And, and I and I think you approach interviews the same way. Um, I, I'm just curious, like, what are what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. um, what are you know, as far as who you're interviewing? What are you hoping to get out of the interview? And what are you hoping listeners will get out of it as well? Um, you know, I'm constantly revisiting that question. What am I? Why am I doing this? What am I? What am I looking to get out of it? You know, mm -hmm. I don't have. Sometimes when, before I interview people, they ask me, what are we going to talk about? You know, what are you going to ask me? And I often say, I'm going to ask you the next thing to the follow up question to the thing you just said. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to ask you. You know, um, I'm definitely looking for connection. Over time, I have come to understand that I'm looking for the intersection between people's lives and the work that they make, which is why I think it is appropriate to talk about how people grew up and where they what they think about and and some of their extra curriculars 
stuff because I think it does inform the work that we make. And I'm really interested in that. I mean, like I started out by saying, I, I'm showing that to my daughter all the time. Something that she says to me in, in our house might, might lead to me writing a song or, you know, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, but I really did start doing it because I was looking for connection. I was just looking to connect with people. When I had a studio in Manhattan, I live in Brooklyn now, but I had a studio in Manhattan for years and I would call musicians in to, to perform on, you know, play on jingles and productions I was working on. My favorite part, even getting to work with some of the greatest musicians, my favorite part was always that half hour before and after when we would just kind of the hang hang. Yeah. And, and trade stories and connect. And um, so I thought at the beginning, maybe it was going to be that more like the hang kind of vibe. But then I realized that what I, what I really enjoy doing is just locking in and listening, you know, and seeing where that goes. And, and I, I find it to be um, very related to playing with people because it's so much about listening. You know, you just come in with everybody, with who you are, with all of who you have been and everything that led you to that moment, you carry that into the room with you and they bring themselves in and then you settle in and, you know, you make this thing. This conversation is, is actually a, a result of the two of you being together for that time. So yeah. I, you know, I'm, um, I just love that moment of meeting somebody and then, and then seeing where we're going to go in the conversation. And, um, so I did, you know, I wish I had a manifesto. I don't, you know, I'm really doing it for very personal reasons. Oh, and you asked why I talk to people, certain people. Yeah. Um, something has to light me up and excite me about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can be at this point that somebody I trust calls me and just says, you really need to talk to this person. Uh -huh. That can be enough. As you know from doing this, um, if you're going to do it regularly, sometimes you have to reach into yourself and find whatever that motivation is to be in the room that day. What, you know, what, maybe you don't even know what it is before you have the conversation with somebody. But um as it's grown, I get pitched a lot. I'm on a lot of PR lists and stuff. And um, and I have done some interviews because I thought it was a good idea for the brand or because I thought it would build more, you know, listeners or because somebody, some publicist really wanted me to. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't have a single conversation that I, I couldn't remember something from and that I haven't learned from. They've all been informative to me. Yeah. But I think the thing that I really need to have before I go in is that there's something about this person that is just or their work that I'm so excited about and it has to be personal and if it's exciting to me hopefully it'll be exciting to people that listen to it also yeah definitely it, do you have any themes or even go-to questions that you find yourself going to the only there's only one that I find myself going to um and it wasn't even mine Ari Herstand who I talked to a couple of times who's a independent music kind of expert mm. um he wrote wrote this book on how to make it in the new music industry he 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 said to me why don't what's you the, ask everybody the book called? sorry if you could just say the name of the book i think it's called how to make it in the new it's music the industry. okay yeah. got it um i think he said was the one who said why don't you ask everybody you talk to what success means to them you know and and let that be a thread that you know connects all these interviews. So now I, I tend to ask people, you know, do you feel successful? What would being successful mean to you? I, I mean, I think that's a great question because yeah, because any, it can be interpreted so many ways and, you know, are you successful once your mom says you are? <laughs> um, so, that, okay. That's, you know, it's interesting. Um, this is a question I'll ask you when, when I was in college, I did a, a media digital media class and, uh, my question was, what is the groove to you? Uh, what, is the, what is the groove to you? Yeah. Oh, well, see, when you ask a question like that, I only can hear my father's voice, uh, <laughs> like in my head, <laughs> the kind of what thing that he said? would say. He would, you know, he'd say something like, you know, the groove is a fact of life. It's undeniable. And you, you know, you, it, it's indescribable, but you know, when it enters the room, you know, some, I don't know, something like that. I love that. <laughs> That's, that's the kind of language that I was like raised with those kinds of ideas, you know? Uh, you know, I asked, I asked McCoy Tyner that question one time I was a college student and he, um, 
he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and then he was whisked away. So I didn't get an answer. You didn't get, well, maybe you did. Maybe that was the answer. I guess so. I guess so. I never thought of that. Uh, any other thoughts on what the groove is? I think, I mean, honestly, I think the subtraction in the, along the lines of subtraction rather than addition, I mean, the groove is something that you know when it is absent. Mm -hmm. The groove can happen in countless ways. The, the groove is not a thing that happens in only one way. And all of us may have our ideas of what the groove is, but you know when something is not grooving, both musically and personally. Yeah. And uh, so I think, it's a process of elimination sometimes. What isn't the groove to find what the groove is? And I actually, I feel like that's the way my whole life is. Is it just an, you know, when it ain't happening, and then you just try to figure out what's left. Uh huh. It's interesting. I, I'm just remembering one one musician I asked that. I think it, it referred to the grooves on a record. Um, well, that no, that is that's clearly where I think that's where it came from. It's like you uh, lock in. It's uh -huh. the, yeah. Okay. The needle in the groove. When you would say we're in the groove, it's because, I mean, look, I could see there's some old school folks that are chiming in here along the side. They probably know better than both of us do. But I'm pretty sure that's where the groove came from, was that uh, hand I never, I didn't make that connection. That's 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 great. Um, gro the groove's important. Uh, so have your, have your goals changed over the years? Yeah. Yeah, definitely they've changed. I'm not even sure that I know what my goals are right now. You know, um, I'm, I'm really, which is ironic because I spent a big part of 2021 doing creative coaching with people where I would ask them to de define what their goals were and try to help them to reach their goals or make de decisions that would help them do that. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I still struggle with it. Um, well, do you need, do you need to, I mean, a lot of artists are not goal oriented. I mean, except for you might have a project, you might have something that you want to see through. Do you think you need to have, it's important to have goals? It's a really good question. Maybe the biggest question, you know? Um, I mean, I know like big picture when I was young, I, I did want to be, I think I wanted to be famous. I think I thought maybe I was going to be famous and I uh -huh. thought maybe I was going to be rich too. And I thought maybe I was going to be, um, successful according to those metrics yeah um and for me my goals i think shifted when i no longer felt young you know like we talked about i you know I, I was writing songs that were being recorded when i was in high school so i i had this idea that if that's where you're starting yeah i mean and by steve miller miller who has some you know some of the biggest hits ever which yeah right so you so there's so there's a there's a you know, there's a part of me at 15 who that was thinking, well, if Steve Miller is the first person to record my songs, then imagine by the time I'm in my 40s, who will have who I will have worked with it. Mm -hmm. But then I didn't I didn't fully follow that. I wasn't in the end. I didn't make the decisions that a person would make if they really were going to be famous. And, you know, like I stayed in Madison for a long time mm -hmm. um, and kind of developed my craft at, in a very mellow way, you know, and moved to New York in my late twenties. And then, um, after having produced a song that won an Oscar, I mean, everything I did, it's not that I wasn't getting feedback, positive feedback. I just was kind of slow and just following the things that were interesting to me. My goals were much more about, like I said, about just doing work that people that I identified as interesting would like. And a lot of times those people were not even particularly famous. You know, it was just, I want to be appreciated by or recognized by people that I, I'm into. And um, those, th that really has been a big part of my, um, my motivation throughout the, the whole thing. And it seems like also making music that you like, obviously. You know, well, you, yeah, because I think, right, I make, make music that I like. And I think that like when I imagine that these people that I like will like it, it you know, you could you could eliminate the that aspect of it and just get straight to I it's like I I like these people, so I want them to like me back. But ultimately, I want to like myself. I want to I, I want to like the music that I make. That's exactly uh -huh. right. that reminds me a little bit of um, I'm friends with uh, with Rock Alon, Bob Moses, and he's talked some about uh, about the you know, how how a musician wants everyone to like them so much. And, you know, and, and they're they're so focused on that that they're not listening, you know, just that's that sort of thing. But but I was curious. Um, 
how do you how how what has been your approach to to finding musicians that where you have a nice musical and interpersonal um, relationship? It's uh, again, I'm not sure which leads, but I think probably the interpersonal side leads before the musical side. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I've been really fortunate in the most of my life to have really nice personal relationships with the people that I connect with creatively. Also, I feel that those kind of happen at the same time. I don't have, have a strategy. I, I, I love meeting people. I can tell that you do too. I mean, I love meeting people and connecting with people. And I feel like if you just have one good experience in the studio or a good gig or a good conversation, there's all that um, currency that's built up that you can, that is the foundation of a, of a good creative relationship with people. I, I love uh, connecting with people in a positive way and, and just building the network that way. And that reminds me also that, that there's like a synergy when you're in the same room with people, which, which is, is not the same when we're doing sending tracks and there's, you know, back and forth though, though there's also the, the positives to that as well, I think. Um, so, so you said you're working on another album. Are you going to all be in the same room and record it? You know, yet, you know, I, so my record, The Art of Conversation, that came out last year was a lot of me alone in the room, but then I sent it, tracks out to friends. And in the end, there were like 60 people who played on the record from all over. Um, so I told myself, because we tell ourselves things all the time, so I, all the time, I told myself, well, the next one, I'm going to get in the room with people and I'm going to make a, a small format live record, mm. the, kind of the antithesis of the last one I did, you know? Uh -huh. um, maybe I won't even play. Maybe I'll just sing, I told myself. And then I came... Uh, home and into the studio in December and just started making demos, which for me is a terrible idea because my demos, I fall in love with my demos and they become the record. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, I've got this record that's even more homemade than the last one was. And I've got like nine songs where it's mostly me and then just a handful of little cherry picked people. Oh. And um, I did get into on the last record, I'm doing it on this one too, using the podcast as a way to cre creatively connect with people and then also to celebrate the people that I do creatively connect with. So most of the people that I am recording with lately are also former or future guests on the podcast. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And I think that's a, a huge benefit. I mean, you're, you're obviously, like you said, you're doing it for a reason of real connection. You're not trying to use somebody to do to, I want to play with them. Um, I had the same experience. I, um, there's a steel pen player who's now in New York. Maybe, maybe you all will meet at some point named, um, Jonathan scales. And I interviewed him and really enjoyed talking with him and yeah. asked him to play on my theme song. And yeah, it's just great how, how that can work out. Um, so, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought a little yeah. bit. So the, 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 um, you have, you have the podcast, you have music production. Okay. I, I know where it's going. Um, the, you had mentioned making money. This, mm. is, this is the thing. And this is a thing that I've, you know, my whole adult life thought about, and I'm guessing you probably have too. How do you balance being true to yourself with what, you know, making music that you like and the, 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 you know, having to make money to pay the bills. And, you know, I, I know you said you were doing some commercial work and, but, but anyway, if you would get into kind of what that process has been like and how that's changed or stayed the same. I, I wish it wasn't so present for me. I mean, when I, every time I ask myself the question, you know, what is success to you? I think it it tends to center around money for me only in the sense that I feel successful. I, I feel successful. I, I make work. People hear it. Would I like more people to hear it? Sure. You know, I make my podcast. People have found it. I'd love more people to find it. Like that would be the, but, but, in general, I find my, I, my, I'm living a successful life and, and all of the getting to wake up in the service of ideas and try to execute those ideas to the best of your ability. That's a very successful life and connect with people and, 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 and maybe help, I don't know, uh, people along the way that, that, that's all successful. But the piece of it that I struggle with is feeling financially secure. I mean, everybody does, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I don't make a lot of decisions based on money. You know, mm -hmm. um, like I think probably my dad would be the first person 
who has said to me, like, if you're interested in making money, you will make decisions to make money. You know, people that are really interested in making money will do the things that they need to do to make the money. Yeah. Um, in my life, I, I write commercials um, and I don't honestly hustle that hard. I worked in a music production company, like on, you know, in their studio for six years mm -hmm. uh, when I first moved to New York and I built up a resume, a, a portfolio, a reel of a lot of commercials. I had an opportunity to write on a lot of big brand commercials. And so then when I became freelance, I had this reel that I could show to people that kind of demonstrated that I know how to do it. And the phone just kind of rang. And mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, it rang way too much at first. And I had to put space you know, create a little bit of space so that I could do the other work that I wanted to that's, do. That's a, that's a good problem. And, and, and also the, the knowing, okay, I need to give room for other things. I mean, I did, I didn't know that for a while. I did a couple of years of just like wake up, write a commercial. Then at night I'd do another one that, I mean, it was like, it was nonstop and, and it was, I could see, okay, there's money here. And, but I wasn't doing any other work that mattered to me. And yeah. that was, and then my daughter was born and it, that, that's the period of time that I was talking to you about before. Um, that changes everything when you start thinking about the money and all that too. Yeah. So I decided that I would start a podcast and I would start making my own music and do all the things that led us to be talking here today. I mean, if I had just done jingles for the last 10 years, we wouldn't be talking right now. That's and, true. Um, so I know that I made a good decision um, for so many reasons, but what mm -hmm. happens now with the commercial stuff is that it, it's just kind of happening in the background and, um, the phone rings when it rings and I take, take my best shot at a commercial and I just need to win enough of them to, to, uh, you know, keep, keep the wheels rolling. And, mm -hmm. and then over time I've learned to supplement it and other work that I do does, you know, also provide some income for me, but that's my relationship with it is like, it's a little bit cosmic in that I just kind of wait for the phone to ring and it, mm -hmm. and it does. And in the meantime, I just am, constantly making other things i'm constantly making other work that i think is important and hopefully um there's enough kind of like i don't know karmic synergy that the phone rings with the money work and then i'm just over here uh doing my thing when 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 i'm not getting called to do that stuff yeah and i think you just answered this next question but i want to ask it anyway did do you did you or have you ever at some point really thought about business the business side of it um marketing all that goes with that I'm not super comfortable with it. You know, I, um, I've never been a cold call person. You know, I'm, I'm much more interested in the sort of organic, the way things happen organically. You know, you meet somebody, there's an opportunity there. You, you recognize that you could do something and it would make sense. Mm -hmm. I realized that, I mean, I just talked to a friend the other day who's actively marketing himself every day. He's making three phone calls a day to people and he's getting yeah. gigs out of it. You know, I have a friend who's doing that as well. <laughs> three calls a day, <laughs> three calls a day. And he said, and, and he said, you know, I did it for a week and I got four meetings out of those calls. So I can see how effective it is. And I think, uh -huh. I guess I haven't, I have never been that kind of person. I, I'm much more interested in I getting projects delivered than I am in somehow marketing myself. If I have a project I'm trying to Mm -hmm. deal with like my podcast for example when i need to move it forward in some way i'll make all the phone calls that i you know if i need to book somebody or promote it or whatever i'll, I'll make all the uh i'll make all the phone calls i need to do and same thing with like right now i'm getting ready to w release a record that i made with my dad this year and mm -hmm. that's coming out in may and so all day long on mark i'll market that record you know that makes sense to me but marketing myself as what? So, but I that guess. makes sense. I mean, it makes sense that your your projects are speak for themselves as far as really marketing yourself. As, you know, you're moving forward with all yeah. these endeavors, um, and you now you 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 do your podcast, the third story, every week. I believe, is that right? I mean, ideally, it, it, uh, it, yes. That's right. There's a lot. I think I think I heard you say one could take 15 hours of time or so. So you know. And the and the format that you described, I mean, the format has evolved over time. But you know, in the in the last couple of years, the introductions have become like little craft projects in and of them, themselves, and then mm -hmm. weaving the music into it. It's, but I want them to be beautiful, you know, and I want them to be beautiful for a long time. I'm see, I see. By the way, side note, I see my friend Paul Peterson is watching. I, I'm seeing notes from him in the side. And um, what's Paul saying? Well, he's saying a bunch of stuff. He's talking <laughs> to my dad in the side. I guess my my dad is here too. 
Hi, everybody. And um, but Paul and I had this idea, which I'm just Paul. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it in public. But we had this idea to start another podcast called Side Hustle Podcast, uh -huh. I like which that. is the, basically the question that nobody ever really comes out with in public, which is you know, what's what do I really do? You know, this is the work <laughs> yeah. that I do. But what do you I really like do? I like that because yeah, because people, you know, yeah. It's, 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 it's people don't always want to show all sides. So, so if they yeah. already know that that's part of it, then that's, that's really good. I like that. Well, um, so your dad's watching. Um, I, I've really enjoyed learning some about him as well. And in, in both your music um, as well through the, the process of starting to know about you. Um, so, and I, and I love that interview with miles. So uh, anyway, thank you very much to, to Leo's dad, Ben for that. Um, that, in that interview with miles, by the way, was an example of what kept me from doing my own interviews for so long. You know, I mean, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to do it for a long time. And, and, and honestly, entering the sort of public space as a musician, son of, he's not even that, you know, it's not that he's super famous, but the people that know him and, you know, I just thought, oh, I've, I've already, there's so much comparison. I'm already dealing with all of this. And then I'm on top of that, I'm going to start interviewing people. And he, he just seemed to know everything and he was so he had such an ease and he was so comfortable and talked to miles and dizzy and max roach and you know every all of them mm -hmm. and um you know when i said earlier that having conversations to me feels a lot like playing with people and i think that the lesson is the same also for me in doing interviews that it is in music it's it's hard to get there but you have to find your way to do it i mean you ultimately have to find you, your groove. You know what? That's what Clyde used to say. He used to say, you got to find your groove. And, you know, my whole childhood, he would say that. And it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, but that's what it means. Yeah. Well, it, it, it seems that you've found your groove. Uh, and, you know, like I said, it sounds like a similar reason why both of us do interview people is to learn, connect. Um, and, uh, so anyway, I, I really appreciate you taking this time to to talk. And, you know, I, I don't know if you feel this way. I'm guessing you do. After an interview, you feel like you know the person. You feel like, you know, we're friends now. <laughs> uh, so which is which is I think that's a beautiful thing. And that's and that's where, you know, the technology of you're you're in Brooklyn. I'm in yeah. Nashville. Yeah. Um, who knows if we would have met otherwise. Um, so I totally agree. And I think, again, like we were saying earlier about intention, like I think that you're intention can be felt you know when you're talking to somebody and you and it's it's legitimately open hearted and interested and there's no agenda you know people feel that and and i think that's achieved through a good a good talk you know yeah absolutely and, and uh, so so do you have a name for your your next album yet i i can't i, I don't i had a few ideas but i don't want to say anything because i i don't know i don't know yet yeah, yeah no problem um the, uh, just, okay, this is a question. That's yeah. that's this is about some thoughts that I've had. Uh, what do you think about these two premise or ideas for for shows, uh, TV shows, not like a network TV yeah. show? But uh, yeah. one's called Percussion Discussion. Um, you get together, you create an arrangement. That whole process yeah. is is uh, recorded and then perform the arrangement and then talk about it. That's one. Yeah. Um, and the I other. Like it. Is, Okay. And the other is now, these are ideas I've had. So I'm just, I'm just now just like asking you your opinion about this, uh, national songwriters plus one, same idea, but, but, um, playing their songs, learning their arrangements or creating an arrangement and then performing it, talking about it. Do you think I like that. Uh huh. And that, that one seems more, well, you're a songwriter. So that makes sense that that would be more of maybe an interest. <laughs> Well, yeah, to, to, absolutely. In thinking about talking to you today, I I thought about my I tell I don't know what your time frame is here. I'm cool. I don't know how long you need to go. Okay, here. yeah, no, I, I'm I'm good. Um, you know, I I always want to respect your time. So, yeah. Um. Well, let's keep talking. In thinking about talking to you as a drummer, I I was thinking about how I don't I never really felt like a drummer in the sense that I think that there are certain personalities that either are drawn to different instruments or different instruments bring out certain personality traits in people. And I never had that kind of like, if I walk into a room with a bunch of drummers, I, I don't necessarily feel a natural affinity. I love playing, but I, and, but I, I don't necessarily know that I would want to only watch the percussion discussion show. Uh, not just uh, so drum centric, not so drum centric. Exactly. Yeah. 
I like yeah. the idea of watching people have to come up with an arrangement in the room and and talk about how that happened. Although, once again, I mean, I don't know if you felt this. I sometimes feel that musicians are not the best at talking about what they do. That's one of the maybe the challenges of doing yeah. the, the podcast. And I had listened to so many interviews with comedians and, you know, sort of public facing people, actors and people that are really good at talking about what they do. And then you get in a room with a musician, even the most expressive musicians, musicians who are, you know, confident and and strong in, in their musical statements. And you ask them what they do. And sometimes they're, they're quiet and reserved and they don't really know how to talk about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you could get in a room with a bunch of people, work out an arrangement and ask them why they did it and how, what it was like. And, you know, and they, well, I don't know. It felt good. It felt good. We got in the groove. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll pitch you one that I, that I've been sitting on okay. just for, just for kicks. It's uh -huh. an analysis of kick drums recorded, the, the recording of kick drums throughout the ages in popular music. Ah, because yeah. I actually think that there's a lot of information about what's happening in the world in the sound of the kick drum. Oh, that could be fascinating. Uh, and that could that could actually draw people in who are not drummers. Uh, yes. So I hope I hope if you do that, that you will do uh, Joe Morello's bass drum on uh, Take Five, Dave Brubeck. I got to put that on the list. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the I had the idea when I talked to the guy from Weedus, the band Weedus, about... Um, about the Metallica kick drum, you know? Uh -huh. uh, and I said to him, I hate that sound. It, it's like, no a, it's like a triggered sound, isn't it? It's, I think it's just like, oh. it's very high, it's very high mid, you know, nasally. There's no sub in it at all. And he said, they were EQing the seventies out of the drums. Uh -huh. I mean, that's essentially what they it was a response to the drum the drum sound that had come before it and the drums were not going to occupy the same space that they had before it was an assertion of of this changing mentality and then when he was saying that to me i thought man i love the idea of looking at the evolution of popular music through something like that uh that, that sounds fascinating and, and i know if you do it you'll it'll be well done and very interesting um so just to sort of start to wrap things up. So it sounds like we have some similar podcasts that we are. are ter so Terry Gross, mm -hmm. um, who most of you, if you don't know who Terry Gross is, she's from Fresh Air. Um, to me, she's one of the greatest interviewers of all time. Um, I, you had said something about, you know, her being the godmother of long form radio and that you, uh, you have a combination of frustration, fr frustration and awe. And I'm just curious what, the things are that are frustrating and that you're in awe of. Wait, when did I, I mean, I know I said that, but you had to have listened to a lot of podcasts to hear me say you know, that. I, I read, I read a few, um, you know, I, I read the tape op. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did, and I don't know if it was in that or yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Terry Gross, Frustration and Awe. Well, Terry Gross and Mark Marin, those were the two that got me going. And, 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 and WTF is another one that I listen to regularly as well. Yeah. I saw Mark Marin interview Terry Gross on stage in Brooklyn a handful of years ago. And oh. I walked out of there saying, I feel like I just saw John Coltrane and Duke Ellington together. Like, the gen because they're, they have a different way about them. She's very NPR and he's much more, you know, the podcast generation, more informal. And, and watching them deal with each other and their their different styles, but they you know came together. It was like watching a beautiful jam session between masters. That's awesome. Um, Terry, why is Terry frustrating to people? I'm not going to talk about why she's frustrating to me. I mean, you know, she's the thing that I in question sometimes. Maybe is it something like that? Well, first of all, I, I think what we have to remember, people like us down here on the ground, is that. Um, you know, she has producers, she has teams of people. She's, you know, she also tends to do it remotely and always has. And I'm not even sure that she's looking at the person. She has a lot of little tricks. She's got notes that she's referring to, you know, oh, she, you, she's not usually in the same room with them. Is that No, right? no. She's, she almost exclusively does it remotely from Philadelphia and people oh, call in. Know. And I think they're in the headphones and they don't see her. I think a big part of her trick is that she, that, you know, it's a sleight of hand when you can't see the person. Yeah. And I think maybe people will reveal themselves even more when they forget that they're being watched. You know? uh -huh. 
Well, it's um, also interesting to think that that she's she's hearing it as we're hearing it, and that we're we're not seeing the person. She's not seeing the person. That's right, and and that's why radio. You know, television is not just radio with pictures. Radio is not just TV without pictures. It's it is like a different. It traditionally it's a very different format, and mm -hmm. so she, you know, she's got a lot of tricks or of, of production of advantages of, you know, techniques that are, that are informing her. And then she still locks in and does that amazing thing where she asks the question. She kind of asks the hard question. She, she leans on her timidity. Sometimes she, 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 she's got a lot of different gears that she can go to, to get mm -hmm. where she needs to go. Um, and I, I respect her enormously and I listen to her. Yes, yeah, sometimes frustrated, but, but I still listen, you know, and never frustrated by what she says, really. I mean, I guess maybe the only time I was frustrated with her. You, well, she, she develops her obsessions and her little fixations and things, but um, Mark also drives me crazy because he loves talking to musicians. And I, sometimes I feel that he doesn't ask the questions that he needs to ask. He, he's very fixated yeah. on here, yeah, yeah. you know, Nonetheless, these are my heroes. These are the people who, Absolutely. you know, who opened the the door and and made me think that maybe I would have something to to contribute in that space. Well, well you do, and you know, you know, I, I've done enough of these where I don't get super nervous, but but I was definitely feeling more nerves talking to you. Um, I and it's just I think it just has to do with respect, um, and it's not that I don't respect other people that I have talked with, but um, but. But yeah, just, you, um, you know, and I think it's important to recognize those things because I know as someone who does what you do, th there's a, that means a lot. It's not just, it's not just, um, that, that acknowledgement I think goes far. I hopefully does, but, but, um, I know for myself, that's why I'm saying that. Um, so anyway, so I, 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 I have, really listen, I just, I just have to acknowledge that. I mean, I, there, there's very little that I can say that would express to you how, how much that means to me other than thank you. I mean, you, you mentioned in the same interview that you asked McCoy Tyner what the groove was. I mean, the fact that you've even talked to McCoy Tyner is incredible to me. And um, I, I'm, I'm really honored and flattered to hear you say that. Thank you. It really uh, does. Well, want to know. well, I really appreciate you joining, um, joining me for cliff chats. And I just want to let people know um, next week, um, same time, 1230 central time. I'm sorry, on Eastern time, uh, Wednesdays, uh, there are cliff chats, but I'm speaking with Denny Fongheiser who played with Queen and was on Tracy Chapman's, um, uh, what's the album? Big album. And also, yeah. uh, the, the spin doctors, big hit, um, not spin doctors, Mr. No. Jones. Well, who is that? Uh, Mr. Jones was, uh, is, uh, uh, counting crows. Counting crows. Yeah. Anyway, so talking with him next week, it will. It is already recorded. Um, something oh, nice. I'm delving into, or some of these are not live. Um, but th thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And um, I'm just doing this. I'm gonna sign off in a minute. But Leo, if you stay on for just a second, everyone have a good rest of your day, and um, hope to interact with you on this space. Oops.